Good evening, folks. Welcome. This is the stpete.net meetup. Tonight we're going to have Steve Smith, or we do have Steve Smith with us. He's going to be talking about design pattern mastery. We'll give it a, a few more minutes as folks trickle in. Uh, we'll disable the drop game during the presentation, so feel free to go ahead and get your drops out there. Uh, I think we've seen in chat, we've got freaking Ward from Indiana. Who else we got in, in chat? We've got C. Hudson 121. Our Dallas is playing the drop game. Oh, he's on a good trajectory to, well, no, I don't know. No. And let's ban that one. You got it? You want me to get it? Oh. No, not whisper. And ban that one. Yeah, Thank I, you. I, I can't do it from this interface. I've never had three of them show up at once when yeah. I started something. That's well, the, the, they love our channels. Hmm. I don't I don't know why. So are you trying to hit that pile of leaves? Is that the drop game? Yes. Yeah. yeah. At least this, this version of it. You have to hit it dead on, I guess, because Coder Cat just flew right past it. <clears throat> I figured that uh, shallow trajectory would have worked well. <clears throat> it's deceptive. All right, so who else we got in chat? Who's the furthest away? So Clayton and I are in the Tampa, St. Petersburg, Florida area. Steve, where are you at these days? I guess you're not traveling. I'm not. I'm in my basement, which uh, is in Kent, Ohio. Kent, Ohio. Okay. It's a pretty good distance. Freaking wards up in Indiana. Who else we got from Ooh, Arizona. out of town? Out of... Arizona's farther. Yeah. Arizona. Nice. Welcome. Welcome. So uh, this is St. Pete.net Meetup. We do host uh, virtually these days once a month on the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, thankfully, since we've gone virtual, we've had a, a lot of great guests that have agreed to come on, uh, Steve being one of them. So really looking forward to tonight's presentation. If anybody locally um, in members of the club want to speak, uh, we'd certainly love to have you. Uh, you would get first pick. Um, then we will broaden our reach and, and look out to the, the greater community for any speakers or topics out there. So. Uh, if, if you want to volunteer yourself or volunteer a coworker to speak, we'd love to have you. If you want to suggest a topic, if there's anything you're interested in, then let us know and we'll do our best to, to find someone to speak on the topic. Uh, Clayton and I have been running the .NET, uh, the St. Pete.NET meetup for four years or so now and uh, been growing that pretty well. So Vicini is the only one from out of the U.S., I think it'll be five years in January, won't it? Did we? Our first one was like a January or a February, and it was right after I moved down. So, yeah, something like that. Oh, we've got some. We've got Silva from Brazil. Welcome. I have to do the math. That might be further. Yeah, I've never. I was never good at, at geography. So, um, and Steve, you said you've got a, a busy week this week. You want to tell folks what you're what you're up to and. Yeah, I've got uh, a couple of virtual workshops with Dev Intersection <clears throat> um, that I'm giving uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. I've got one on uh, domain-driven design patterns, which is a four-hour workshop with about eight hours worth of content in it. Um, so it's it's going to be probably about three and a half hours of me explaining things. And, uh, and then I have a very extensive set of labs that I've been working on that uh, you'll have that you won't get done in the four hours, but uh, you'll have them available to, to do on your own time. Because um, I hate, especially on a virtual thing, like setting aside like a big block of time for you to go through labs when I'm just sitting there and not even able to come up to your computer and help you. Uh, and then on Thursday, there's another workshop on uh, clean architecture with ASP.NET Core. So um, if, if you want, I'm pretty sure they're still uh, accepting registrations for those. So just go to uh, devintersection.com and uh, look for those workshops or there's a bunch of other great workshops this week as well. Great. All right. With that, I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'll hang out after the presentation as well, and and continue to to answer any questions and and chat about the world and the state of tech and that type of thing. Uh, but uh, we'll let Steve go full screen here and 
I'm, I'm assuming any and all questions are welcome. If if Steve misses them, we'll we'll be sure to call attention. So please do ask any any and all questions in chat, and and we'll get to make sure they're they're addressed. All right, sounds good. So thanks everybody. I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Steve Smith. I go by R Dallas Online because uh, Steve Smith is really hard to get a, a username for. Um, you can find me at uh, R Dallas in various places. I also have a podcast that uh, has been a little bit on hiatus, but uh, it was never about modern stuff anyway. So if you go to uh, weeklydevtips.com, there's about 68, I think, is where I ended up. Uh, different little five minute to 10 minute long episodes with, uh, with various tips from me and some guests. Um, I encourage you, if you're interested, just like start it from the beginning and, and go from, from the start. Uh, and I'm hoping in 2021 to get back into recording some new ones. I've actually had one ready to edit and publish for about four months now, and I just have been burnt out on the whole thing. But uh, maybe 2021, I'll get back to that. And then I have a uh, group coaching program that I run called Dev Better. Uh, and if you're interested in that kind of thing, you want to level up your career, uh, learn how to be a better developer, or just learn how to get a raise uh, or find a better job, um, go to devbetter.com, check that out. Uh, it's not free, but it's a, it's a really good group of people that are all focused on, on improving themselves. And with that, um, let me get my little clicker here. and. We'll use that with the slides. All right, so uh, after today, uh, assuming that you have a Pluralsight subscription or or you can you know get a trial, uh, you could check out some courses that might be of interest. Um, I've published quite a few this year. They're, they're all little short ones on individual design patterns because Pluralsight used to have a 16-hour-long design pattern library course, uh, and it's still there. It just doesn't show up in the search results. So if you if you want to see the old versions of these courses, you can go to any of the authors that were involved, like myself, and then just look in their, in their listing of courses, you'll see a, a retired course called Design Pattern Library. Um, but then I've got a bunch of design patterns that, uh, that were in that library that I've updated and refreshed um, with the latest versions and using .NET Core, uh, and you'll see them all here in this list. There's a uh, good course called Domain Driven Design Fundamentals um, that, that covers some of these topics as well that I'm going to talk about tonight. So you should check that out. Uh, Julie and I, Julie Lerman, um, and I are planning on doing a refresh of that course sometime very soon, probably first quarter of next year, it looks like at this point. Um, and so, you know, that'll be good, but because this one's from 2014, it's using full framework.net, but the principles and the patterns haven't changed, right? So it'll just be, you know, the demos will run in .NET Core, but otherwise the content is, is pretty much the same either way. Um, and in this design patterns overview course, if you're just interested in, in learning more about design patterns, uh, I would encourage you to check that one out. It's uh, it's only about 37 minutes, it says there. You can watch it at one and a half speed, so you can you know get through it even faster. Uh, and it kind of walks you through, like, why do you want to learn design patterns, uh, with a little bit of which I'll cover tonight, but not too much. Um, and then kind of shows you how you can stack and combine different patterns together. All right, so with that, um, let's, let's talk about design patterns. Design patterns is a... Uh, topic that I'm very excited about and passionate about. I've been, been writing about and talking about them for uh, probably decades at this point because um, I'm getting old. Uh, and what a design pattern is in software is it's not like a cookie cutter recipe uh, solution, like a, like a Stack Overflow answer sometimes might be, where you can just copy paste it into your into your application. But it's more of a general reusable approach to a problem. It's a way of structuring the the pieces that you're going to use to build uh, the problem, uh, to build a solution to the problem. Um, and so it's it is sort of like a template. It's, it's something that you can you know kind of fit into your design. Um, and, and follow you know the pattern that it describes. Each pattern has a specific name, uh, and one of the reasons why that's important is that it gives us a vocabulary that we can use to talk about programming concepts and programming design options uh, with this higher level uh, set of, of terms that, that really lets us convey a lot more information more clearly than if we didn't have those terms and if we tried to just describe everything in low level detail, which, which I'll, I'll show in just a moment. Uh, the idea of design patterns is actually industry agnostic, and the um, the first pattern book uh, really that, that came out, and the one that the design patterns, the famous design patterns gang of four book is based on, um, is this book here called A Pattern Language by Christopher Alexander, who's an architect. Um, so it's cited in the uh, the classic design patterns book, which is is essentially uh, a, a good reference. It's it's like a dictionary or encyclopedia when you read it. Like each pattern is uh, is very uh, you know, 
boringly, let's say, defined and, and, and very clearly and precisely, but there's there's no story to it. There's there's no overarching flow to the book. Um, it's it's a reference and it's it's a worthwhile reference. I would definitely encourage you if you don't if you don't have this book to, to think about picking it up, because if nothing else, it looks great on your your bookshelf to impress your visitors if we ever you know have visitors again um literally this is so impressive to have on your bookshelf if you just google for programming bookshelf um, and take a look at the first results you'll see like they're almost without doubt going to have design patterns on their bookshelf it's it's sort of required so here are some images that i found this is one here see if you can spot it it's right there on the top shelf right next to fowler's refactoring which is another good book all right here's another one i found where do they have it it's right there at the very first one, top left, good spot. Now, this person, they had too much time on their hands. They decided to organize their books by color, I think. Uh, and so you don't see it here, but it turns out they have a really long bookshelf. And if you scroll far enough, you get to the section where, yes, in fact, there it is. They have it, too. So um, if, if you don't have this book on your bookshelf, it means you're not a real programmer and you need to go and give money to the, the Gang of Four so that they can continue. I don't think they've necessarily written any other books so they're, they're just living on the royalties from this one book that they wrote in the 90s and you know we don't want them to be homeless so it's it's you know just do your part to, to keep them uh you know out of out of the, the poorhouse um, but seriously it is it is a good book and it is one that's on my shelf over there um and it's 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 worthwhile to to have a read to uh you can get it in digital format of course too but then you don't get the the bookshelf effect all right, so let's talk about learning. Um, design patterns are something like, like many other types of things that you might learn where you're gonna typically go through stages of learning. Uh, and I'm sure there's a whole science to this that probably has terms that are different than, one, than the ones I use. Um, but these are the terms that, that I've found to be useful in describing the different stages that I've gone through when I've tried to learn various things, whether it was design patterns or martial arts uh, or music or, or things like that. Um, you, you have different techniques that you need to learn and practice. Um, and and initially, you don't even know what they are, right? If you're starting into a new hobby or a new field, you know, you don't even know what you don't know. And so you start from this place of ignorance, this sort of stage zero where you don't know that these things even exist. Um, and perhaps before you heard about design patterns you know, or before tonight, if this is brand new to you, um, that's where you're coming from, right? For an individual pattern, you may not even know that that pattern is a thing, that like someone uses that name or that term and you have no idea what they mean by that. Uh, and so as soon as someone does do that and you become aware that this is a thing, then now you're, you've reached stage one. You're at least, you have a known unknown, right? There's a thing that you know about, um, that, that you've heard about that you don't really know much, but at least you know it's a thing. Um, and so at this point, perhaps you, your curiosity is awakened and you start to think, huh, okay, so there's this thing um, that might be useful to me. Maybe I should learn more about it. Um, and so you, you're not really uh, actively learning it yet. You just you know, are aware that it's there. And, and so you're ready for the next step, which is this overzealous step. And, and I call it this, it maybe doesn't always have to be, but in my experience, it always is. Because in, in the overzealous stage of learning, you're just trying this thing anywhere you can to see where it works and where it doesn't. Um, and with, with design patterns, uh, you, know, you, you might learn about this new pattern like the singleton. And now everywhere you look, you're like, oh, could I use a singleton for that? Could I use a singleton for that? Maybe I could use a singleton over here. Um, and, you, and you try it in lots of different places. Um, and it's not just individual developers that can you know, suffer from this, right? If you've ever seen industry buzzwords where it's like, hey, microservices, microservices are awesome. Let's use microservices everywhere, right? That, that always happens with the industry. There was a time in uh, the early aughts where Microsoft just wanted to put XML on everything, right? And that was just the way that Microsoft felt about XML was that they, nothing, nothing had too much XML in it. Uh, and then one day that just went away and everybody said, nope, XML is not cool anymore. Everything's got to be JSON. Um, and, and so that's just you know, the way these things go. Um, and that's how you learn. That's how you figure out from your own experience, this thing worked well here. It didn't work well in all these other places where I tried it and it, and it was a dismal failure. Um, and so eventually, after you've done that enough, you reach this level of mastery where you've practiced trying to use the thing in enough places. You know the places where it worked, the places where it didn't. Um, you're kind of like an AI that's learning, right? You've got a set of things and you've determined from that set, these are the things that matched and that worked and these are the things that didn't. And so now when I get a new sample, I can look at that and I can say, hmm, that looks like something that fits one of the ones that worked before. So I'm gonna, I'll, I, I should be able to try this here and it, I should expect some success. All right, so my goals for you after this presentation are that you are at least at stage one with a number of useful design patterns, uh, and you're armed with some resources to dive deeper into patterns that are of interest to you. 
Uh, and, and like they said uh, at the start, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, and then I'll, I'll keep an eye on a separate chat that I have that's in private. Uh, and, and they'll let me know if there's any good questions that they want to ask. So you have to meet the bar uh, from the hosts in order for your question to make it to me. Uh, so, so think hard about what your questions are. All right. So now let's, let's talk for a little bit about language. Um, one of the most important things about design patterns, as I mentioned, is that they arm us with language that allows us to have these conversations in a more clear uh, manner and, and at a higher level. Uh, we can convey a lot of information with much fewer words uh, and more clearly with you know, less, less likely to have error if we have these patterns. So um, here's an example, uh, and, and I'll read this to you. I know you're going to read it faster than me, but um, imagine you heard this during a code review and it said, we have some tight coupling to the database here. We could probably fix it if we apply some refactorings. Maybe we can start by extracting an interface, and then we can extract a method that contains that persistence code. After that, we can extract that method into its own class that implements the interface we created, and then we should be able to replace the local instantiation of the class with a parameter that we can pass in and assign to a field. All right, now I said all that because I wanted it to be painful to you that I had to say so much, um, when in fact we might have just said, hey, there's some tight coupling to the database here. Why don't you use the repository pattern and eliminate it? That's it. Like, yeah, okay, if, if they know what that pattern is and you know what that pattern is, you could have this conversation and you've conveyed a lot of information um, in a very small set of words. All right. So learning design patterns obviously takes some time. Um, it's something that you, you need to spend time learning yourself and then you also probably need to educate other members of your team on these patterns as well, because the first time that you introduce them, they may be like, whoa, what's that? Um, and so, you know, hopefully you're in a position where folks are open to new ideas and, and you know, can take a little time to, to learn and improve. And if you're watching this, I assume that you are, um, but it's those other people that aren't as, as smart and cool as you that, that we have to worry about. Um, so. Don't, don't be the folks that are too busy to improve. Try and, try and arm yourself with the additional knowledge that these patterns can give you. And then be cognizant of the fact that you might be in that overzealous stage. Um, and, and don't try and, and apply it everywhere, especially in your production code, right? There's a, there's a place for side projects and learning and katas and exercises and things like that, uh, where you can practice these things before you, you take them out on your employer. All right, so looking at design patterns in general, there, there are a bunch of them. Here, here's just a few. I need to fix the, uh, the formatting on one of them, it looks like. Um, and so the, uh, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book has a whole lot of them. Um, there's a whole lot of them that have that. Huh? Somehow my fonts got slightly larger or something. Um, and, and so these are just some of the design patterns that are uh, available that you might learn about. The ones that we're gonna talk about tonight though, I don't have time to cover all of these in, in one user group session. Uh, like I mentioned, there's a, uh, there's a library of them on Pluralsight that has most of these covered and it's like 16 hours long. So um, that, that wouldn't fit into, into one user group talk. But I am gonna cover a few especially helpful patterns. So I wanna talk about the singleton pattern because uh, it's, it's very common, it's very simple. Uh, it also kind of serves dual duty as both a design pattern and, and an anti-pattern. Um, then I wanna talk about the strategy design pattern, which if you're using dependency injection, you're probably already familiar with. So um, if you didn't know this pattern by name, uh, then you might walk away from tonight saying, hey, I already know the strategy pattern, uh, congratulations. We'll talk about the repository pattern, which you likely are, are familiar with as well, because it's very common these days. Um, but I might be able to share a few things you don't know. We'll talk about the proxy and the decorator, because they actually happen to be very closely related to one another. And then the uh, specification pattern, which is one of the ones that um, I've grown very fond of uh, in the last few years. It's, uh, it's one that comes from domain driven design. All right, so real quick, let's talk about the singleton. Um, the way the singleton works is you have a class and you have a requirement that that class only exists once in your application. There's only one instance of that class at any given time. Um, and so the pattern says that the class is responsible for this behavior. It's the, the class's job to make sure that there's only ever one of these things. Um, it's generally considered an anti-pattern because it essentially turns that class into global state uh, and global state that uh, generally is, is difficult to test because you can't reset it easily to um, isolate it from other tests. You know, one test can change it and cause a problem with another test, um, things like that. They can also cause the same kinds of problems in production potentially. Um, it's generally not the best idea to manage your object lifetimes in the class itself. Um, that problem has been solved in another place and that's through using an IOC container uh, or a DI container, whatever you want to call it. So 
Um, it's perfectly fine to have singleton behavior. That's not unusual. There's, there's lots of in, in instances where a class should only exist once inside of the application. The problem and the reason why singleton is often considered to be an anti-pattern is that implementing that behavior using the singleton pattern is not ideal. There's, there's better ways to do this. Um, if you're using .NET Core, uh, which hopefully you are, uh, you have dependency injection just baked in from the start. If you're using uh, previous versions of .NET, uh, you know, MVC, whatever version, MVC 5, let's say, Web API 2, um, you can add support for dependency injection very easily. If you have access to dependency injection in some kind of a, a container, an IOC container, a DI container, the services collection in .NET Core, um, then it will manage the lifetime of the objects that are in it. Uh, and so with ASP.NET Core, you'll have this configure services method inside of startup. Um, and somewhere in there, you can add things and you can specify that they should have singleton scope. Um, and by doing that, you ensure that this particular service will only ever have one instance. Um, you could also, of course, add things as scoped or as transient, which are the other two default lifetimes in ASP.NET Core. Um, scoped meaning that there's going to be one instance per web request, and transient meaning every time anything wants one of these services, I'll give it a new instance. Um, for, for some things, you're going to want uh, each one of those, right? Entity framework, typically you want scoped. Um, some expensive uh, shared resource, maybe you want it to be a singleton. Uh, lots of other little things, they might be fine with transient. But the, the right place to determine what that lifetime behavior should be is inside of this IOC container. That's its whole job, is to manage the objects and their lifetimes for your application. Uh, if you put that responsibility inside of your class by using the singleton pattern, then you're automatically violating the single responsibility principle because your class presumably has some responsibility for actual work it does. And now it also has the responsibility of managing its lifetime. Um, so, so there's a few reasons why you don't want to follow the actual singleton pattern, um, and, and it's better to just implement it through another mechanism. It almost didn't make it into the design patterns book because um, they were debating about whether or not it was, you know, one that they wanted to promote in the book. <clears throat> All right, any questions so far? I don't see any. None of you have passed the bar yet. Uh, so let's talk about the strategy pattern. Uh, and strategy pattern is is definitely one of my favorite patterns. Kind of ties into what we were just talking about with dependency injection. The intent of the strategy pattern is to encapsulate a family of related algorithms and then let the algorithm vary and evolve independently from the classes that use it. That's coming straight out of the, the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. What it really means is that you want to be able to pass in different implementations of an abstraction so that you can have basically a, a plug and play architecture um, for your system. And whatever dependencies it might have, you can just pass those in and you can decide at runtime or at compile time, whichever one you like, which dependencies to pass in. Um, so you can evolve you know, how that behavior is going to work by, by just passing in a different instance of that abstraction. The, the benefit of this is that it allows a class to maintain a single purpose. So if you have a class that needs to do a few different things, uh, maybe you have a, a class that needs to fetch some data from the database, format it a certain way, and then output it in a particular format. Well, if you put all of that in one class, you're going to violate the single responsibility principle. And then anytime any of those change, like where am I getting the data, how am I formatting it, what kind of output format am I using, um, you're going to have to change that class. right? So it's going to break the open-close principle too, because anytime you need to extend its behavior, you're going to have to open that class and recompile it and change it. Um, by using the strategy pattern, what you could do is you could pass in some type of data accessor abstraction, some kind of formatter abstraction, some kind of output abstraction, and then inside the class, it could just be responsible for the logic of how it you know, uses those things to create the report. Um, you want to change where the data is coming from? No problem. Just inject in a different instance of the data source abstraction. Um, it's essentially a way to do dependency injection through the constructor. Um, and so it's it's really great for single responsibility because now you can take extra responsibilities out of your class, put them into individual classes that just implement a simple interface, and then inject those into the class through this pattern. Um, and I already mentioned it, it helps with the open close principle as well. So check that out. Here's kind of the uh, the structure of the strategy pattern. You have a context, which is the class that needs 
the uh, the information, the the the, the strategy. Um, it exposes through an interface um, the the thing that it wants to do. Uh, this could be. Uh, uh, this this will be on some type of, of state within that class, so usually a field, possibly a property, um, and then somehow that that instance gets populated. So typically, with traditional dependency injection, um, it's going to get passed in through the constructor. It'll be assigned to a field or property, and then inside of that class, in its methods, it can work with that instance using that that local field. Um, at compile time, when you create these things, your your strategy interface uh, is defined as the abstraction, and then you have concrete implementations of it, uh, and you can create as many of those as you need. Um, a lot of times, you're only going to need one, right? And so, a question that some people have is, what's the point of having an interface if I only have one implementation? Why don't I just use that implementation everywhere? Um, since the whole idea of an interface is to allow me to swap between different versions, and I know I'm never going to do that. I only ever need this one thing. So, isn't it just you know gold plating my code or a waste of time to bother with the interface? Um, and the, I would argue that it's not uh, a waste of time because one, writing an interface takes virtually no time. Uh, it literally is one line of code per method in your class, so it's tiny. Um, and two, just by having the interface, that means inside your tests, you can easily use some kind of a test double, a fake, a mock, a stub, whatever you want to use or call it, um, instead of that actual implementation of that class. And if that actual implementation has any kind of external dependencies, like talking to a database or a file system or a web service or whatever, um, it's going to be really hard to test your system if you can't easily swap that out with a test double. Um, and so using interfaces allows you to do that. And the strategy pattern is a great way for you to take that and, and implement it in such a way that you get this great loose coupling in your system. All right, so common usage for the strategy pattern is dependency inversion and dependency injection. Dependency inversion refers to um, the, the idea of uh, inverting dependencies of, of how one class depends on another um, so that the, the structure is, is opposite of how you would normally expect. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, it goes hand in hand, of course, with the dependency inversion principle, um, which is one of the solid principles as well. Dependency injection is a technique that I've referenced a few times where you pass in the dependencies of a class, usually through its constructor, sometimes through a property or a method. Um, when you use the strategy pattern with dependency inversion and dependency injection, you're able to decouple the class from its dependencies uh, and responsibilities. You're able to take your class and make it smaller because you're going to take some of the functionality that was in this big class, pull it out, and then inject it back in as a different class. Um, and so you end up with multiple smaller classes that each do one thing, uh, and you can compose them together very fluidly by you know, just taking your, your configure services method and deciding at runtime, okay, when something needs this interface, I'm gonna use this implementation. Um, and then you wanna change it, easy. You just change it in that one spot, now your system does something different. It's like little Lego bricks that you can swap around. Instead of when you have one giant class where everything is hard coded, uh, it's much more difficult for you to quickly swap out functionality and try different things. All right, when you want to refactor a class to uh, take advantage of the strategy pattern, I have another course on Pluralsight called Refactoring uh, for C Sharp developers. Actually, I have three refactoring courses, but that's the, the most recent one. Um, what you want to do is create an interface that represents this section of code that you want to pull out of a larger method. Um, and then implement that interface by taking that code and just putting it into a new class instance that implements that interface. Um, then inject that interface through the constructor. And now in the original place in the code where you were just executing this block of code, uh, instead call your field that you injected and call that new method that's on that interface. And that's it. So it's like four steps. You're able to take a big ugly class and break it up into a couple smaller classes and have everything still work the way it did before. All right, now let's let's talk for a minute about hidden dependencies. Hidden dependencies are uh, a problem, especially when it comes to testing, um, but also in, in actual production. So when you have hidden dependencies, one of the problems that you'll have is 
developers will expect to be able to use this service that's inside your system and they'll look at it. Maybe they'll just use IntelliSense, right? Maybe they don't even actually look at the source code. They're just like, hmm, I seem to remember that there was a service that did what I needed. I think it was the uh, the order service. Check that out. Okay, dot. Yeah, okay, I see. It's got all these methods. Let me see. Does it have the one I want? Yeah. Okay, order service dot, you know, send order. Perfect. That's what I think I need. Boom. I'm going to go home early today. Uh, you know, build it. Everything compiles. Good. Let's test it out. I'm going to run it. And as soon as you run it, it starts blowing up at runtime. You know, at compile time, it was fine. Everything compiled, no errors, looked good. Runtime, it's like, oh, I don't have this database I need. I can't do my job. Pfft, yellow screen of death. Um, oh, try again. Oh, pfft, I don't have this configuration setting I need. I can't do my job. Right? And you just keep hitting that wall of all these other things that the system needs that it didn't tell you about. Right? You nude the thing up uh, inside your code, and it had an empty constructor that acted like it would just do whatever you wanted. And you called the method. You had the right arguments. It looked good. Um, but at runtime, it's just breaking all over the place. So. The problem with this is those hidden dependencies. And what you want to do instead of having those hidden dependencies is follow something I call the explicit dependencies principle. And the explicit dependencies principle basically says that your classes need to declare their dependencies in their constructor. If you have dependencies that are going to keep you from doing your job at runtime, um, if they're not provided, then you need to ask for those through your constructor. You shouldn't just assume that they're going to be there or that the developer that's calling you somehow magically knows that they're there. Um, the way that you document that you have those dependencies is by requesting them inside of your constructor. Now, if you're in a big legacy system and it's not designed for dependency injection and you're not so sure that you can just start doing this, um, you can kind of fake this by saying, I'm going to have a constructor that's going to list out all my dependencies so that you could pass them in and give me those implementations. And I'm also going to have a default constructor that's parameterless, and it will just try and new up all these dependencies I need um, because that's the way it works now in this legacy system. And so that's a pretty common stopgap measure. It's not perfect. There's lots of, lots of issues with that. You don't want to do that as your, as your primary design if you're writing new software. But in a legacy system that doesn't already take advantage of DI, um, that can be a good way to move the, the design forward and start being able to get some of the benefits of dependency injection, even if you don't have full support for it everywhere. The big thing is you want to avoid those hidden dependencies that surprise developers at runtime uh, when they're trying to, to implement something on this, on this class. Um, if you avoid making non-stateless static calls, avoid uh, instantiating classes that have dependencies um, inside of these, these services, then you probably won't have any hidden dependencies, right? So if you have a class that, that doesn't talk to infrastructure, doesn't talk to a database or write to a file or any of that, and it doesn't instantiate anything else that does do those things, um, either through direct instantiation or by calling a static method, um, then that's fine, right? You have a, uh, a stateless, uh, service, you can you can use that anywhere you want. It doesn't have any dependencies you need to worry about. Um, it's it's the other kind where it's going to make your your system more coupled and more difficult to use or to test uh, that you want to try and avoid. When you're uh, directly instantiating things inside your code, usually with the new keyword, just remember new is glue. Um, so I wrote a, an article about this a long time ago. It's easy to remember because it rhymes. Um, anywhere in your code base, you see the word new, especially if it's newing up you know, some kind of a component that has side effects, you want to think really hard about whether or not that belongs there. Um, remember when you're thinking about responsibilities that new is creating this tight coupling between the classes, and it's also making a decision that the class you're in, the function you're in, has a dependency on that exact implementation of that functionality, not on some abstraction, not on some you know kind of abstract way of, of getting the thing it needs, but that exact one. Um, and usually in modern software, the decision for which exact collaborator your class should have is not your responsibility. That's the responsibility, again, of that DI container um, that, that's kind of wired up when the application starts. That's who should be deciding who all the collaborators are inside your system, not the individual classes themselves, typically. Um, so just be conscious of the consequences of using new. It's not that new is bad. It's not that new is evil, and you should never use new. Steve Smith says, don't use new. Um, that, that's not true. Uh, you just want to be aware and not use it uh, without thinking about it, right? It, it does create a dependency between your uh, function or method or whatever it is you're doing, your class, uh, and the specific instance that you're instantiating. Uh, if you need loose coupling, you want to replace uh, anywhere you're using new or anywhere you've got a static method call with the strategy pattern, which, again, is just another way of saying dependency injection um, for all intents and purposes here. 
All right, so I still have no questions for anybody. I must be doing such a good job. Everything good? Cool, all right. Um, then we're gonna move right along to the repository pattern. And I couldn't find a good visual for a repository a few years ago when I was looking. Um, so a depository was the closest I got. So that's where this book drop thing came from. But it's kind of relevant to a repository because a book drop is usually at a library and a library is sort of like a repository of knowledge. So, so I thought it worked, all right? So let's talk about data access. So the repository pattern is all about abstracting data access. Um, and if you know that, that's most of what you need to know about the pattern, because other than that, it's just another service, right? If you have a, uh, an application, brief segue here, if you have an application and it has a bunch of uh, types in it, right? Like, like they all do, right? It's got, it's got customers and orders and products, let's say. Um, and, and so you have services that work on those types, right? And if you're really creative with your names, they might have names like product service and order service. Um, but if you look at those, you don't necessarily know exactly what they do until you open it up and see, or if you know that it's at this layer versus this other layer, maybe that tells you something from the namespace, what it is. Um, but if you have a product service and, and, and you change the name and you call it product repository, that is changing exactly what the intent of that service is. Right now, anyone that knows what that pattern means or what that name means understands that that is a data access service. It's still just a service, right? It's still just a product service, um, but it's, it's a specific type of product service because we're gonna choose that name for it. And we're gonna say, by saying that this is a repository, we're telling you this is a data access service. Um, and so everybody knows that's the intent and stuff that's related to data access goes in there and stuff that's not related to data access probably doesn't go in there. All right, so now let's talk about data access evolution. Uh, when I started writing software, it was in the late 90s and active server pages, the original ASP, um, was, was the way to go. Now, now called classic ASP or legacy ASP or nobody even talks about it, so we don't care what it's called, ASP. Um, and in ASP, uh, it was basically all written in script. Uh, it wasn't compiled, and so the, uh, the interpreter just read from the top of the file down to the bottom of the file um, and, and executed the code as it went. And if it found a problem, it just stopped right there and blew up, and, and that's what you got on your page was that much of it executed. Um, and so in this, there wasn't really any separation of concerns. You basically just had data access baked directly into the UI and you would have HTML and then you would have some code and it would go and talk to us, get some data and then there would be some more HTML and then there'd be some more code and some more data. Um, and, and everything was just kind of coupled together. And so your, your data access logic uh, was, was all in the classic ASP and then ASP.NET came out around 2001. Uh, and it was web forms. We didn't call it web forms at the time. It was just ASP.NET. Um, but it had this code behind with this method thing that they uh, they borrowed from VV6, um, where where you had event handlers for for page load and button click and stuff like that. And it was great because it had a, a designer surface, and you could just double click, and it would open up the method. You could type in what you wanted it to happen. Um, but in there as well, there was no separation of concerns generally, right? Uh, the big change was that you went from uh, using a data access with a record set inside of ASP and then in ADO.net uh, and you know system.data.sql client, now you had you know the data tables and data sets and data readers and things that .NET brought. Um, but at the end of the day, you had a user interface and it talked to a database. Um, and later on, maybe you added some more additional layers, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But but at the at the very simplest of applications, it looked like this. There was no abstraction. Um, you had compile time. You ran the user interface. It needed to know uh, just about itself, really. Um, and then at runtime, um, it talked directly to the database, right? So if you wanted to write unit tests for this, there was no way to abstract out the, the business logic from the data logic from the UI. Like, that wasn't even a thing um, in this era, right? or at least for these types of apps that I wrote. So the biggest thing that was missing from here was abstraction. There was no way to abstract away the data access. Everything was tightly coupled. Um, it led to these really big ball of mud systems. And it didn't help that ASP didn't have any type of component model. Uh, so include files was the closest you could get to code reuse. Um, .NET, of course, you know, made leaps and bounds better uh, improvements on that. Um, but it was still really easy to, to ship stuff that had all the logic baked into the UI. Um, and for a while there, Microsoft even kind of promoted that because they would ship things like, you know, these drag and drop data controls that you could just drop right on your page and they would talk to the database. Um, and, and those were like, you know, impossible to test or, or debug. Um, but they made really great demos at conferences where you could just build a site in five minutes with just your mouse. Uh, and so that's why they sold a lot of that stuff. 
Um, so the solution to fix this is to not depend on the, the concrete implementations, but instead depend on interfaces, depend on abstractions. And what do we want to call these interfaces for data access? Well, repositories is a pattern that comes from domain-driven design, uh, and it's it's the name that that, that uh, approach to building software uses, um, and it's really caught on, right? The DDD book was written in 2004, um, so it's been around for a minute, and, and so a lot of folks have, have picked up that pattern, and they're using it, whether they're using domain-driven design or not. Um, now, the key thing I want to point out here is that the interface, the abstraction, is the important part of what makes a repository, not the implementation. Because um, there's a lot of misinformation about how uh, you don't really need a repository pattern if you're using an ORM because the ORM already does the repository. Like, well, no, it doesn't because the ORM is an implementation and the implementation is incidental, right? The repository is the abstraction, right? The implementation you plug into that abstraction and you could have many different types of those implementations. Um, it's an abstraction that you own. Right, so you could change it, you could evolve it, you could change how you want to implement it. If you're using some vendor's abstraction that you don't own and, and when they ship a new version, they change it on you, then you don't really have an abstraction that you can rely on, right? You want to have something that's part of your code base that you control as this abstraction. All right, I see I've got a question. Hi, Steve, do you use any other DI container like Autofact, Ninject, or others, or only Microsoft Native? Um, I do use Autofact typically if I if I need more than what's in the Microsoft Native uh, box. So so by default, if you just do file new project with .NET Core, um, you get the service collection, and that works great for most of what you might need. Um, if you want more than that, uh, then, then Autofact works great. I used to be a big fan of Structure Map um, in the .NET days. Uh, it's it's no longer being maintained, so so Autofact uh, is is my recommendation these days. Um, there's a bunch of them, and and um, they're all, all all of the ones that have been around for a while are are, are pretty good. So uh, it's not to say the other ones aren't good. It's just my my preference at the moment is Autofact. Why would you want to use Autofact versus something else? Someone might be wondering. Um, one of the features that I like about it is that if you have a solution that uh, is comprised of multiple different projects, um, you can actually take a lot of the rules about which interfaces get wired up to which implementations and put them in individual modules and then store those modules in the projects where where the those types are. Uh, and then when your web uh, project when you start up and you have configure services and you configure your container, um, you can just tell Autofact, hey, go get the module from over there and the module from over there and wire everything up. Um, and what that does is it makes it so your dependency uh, wire up code is, lives closer to where that stuff is. And for a large application, it means that your startup uh, configure services method doesn't get really huge and, and hard to follow. Um, so there's that feature. There's a, there's a few other features like uh, wiring up open generic uh, types that's easier to do with Autofact. Um, doing things with proxies uh, I think is easier to do with Autofact. I think you can do that with, uh, I'm pretty sure I have done that with configure services too. Um, but there, there's a few features that, uh, that the custom DI containers have that the others don't. And then uh, someone asked, how would you build your interfaces when using Entity Framework? Um, I'll get to that. Let me let me get to that. So um, let's talk about repositories. So when you start using repositories as an abstraction, here's the here's the really key thing to look at here. And this was mind blowing for me years and years ago when I first understood it because um, there was a point in time when I'd been writing software. You know, I started learning how to code when I was a kid, um, and then was coding professionally for a few years before I really understood this this diagram, which is when I build the software it has a certain chain, a certain call chain that it, the compiler checks that expects that this method calls that class with that method and calls this other method. Um, and when I run the software and I, and I stop at a breakpoint and I look at the call stack, I see that exact same chain, right? I'm, I'm in this method, which is called from that method, which is called from that method, and those things are the same, right? As soon as you start using abstractions and interfaces, they're not the same. You can have a call stack at runtime that's totally different than what you compiled. Um, and that was like, whoa, really? Um, because that suddenly changed like all the ways that I could build my software. It was like, instead of having this one rigid flow where I enter the program here and it calls this and it calls that and this depends on that. Now it was totally flexible and I could, I could recreate it however I wanted uh, in a very modular and plug and play way. Um, and it's something that I, I, I wished I would have learned earlier in my career, although um, at this point it was it was in the distant past. So hopefully if, if that's something that's new to you, you, at least take that away from from this talk tonight. Um, so when you have the repository, 
uh, it's important to remember it is just a data access abstraction. Um, there's nothing really magic about it. It was introduced as part of DDD, has become very popular outside of it, separates persistence responsibility from business and UI classes. So what is persistence responsibility? That means how do I fetch uh, my entities uh, from a database and how do I store them to a database? And then if I have anything related to that, like how do I query them? How do I decide what data gets included when I fetch them? Um, how do I decide how much, uh, not just not just how many rows of data, but how many columns of data? How do I select and just get the right columns I want so that I can have an efficient way of doing data access? Um, those are all things that are data access responsibilities that ideally your repository can handle for you. Um, so let's talk about some of the, the benefits. It helps ensure the single responsibility principle. Um, the reason for this is because now that, that data access responsibility is not in your UI layer, it's not in a controller um, or, or in a service somewhere that, that is having to do that logic um, in addition to other things, in addition to business logic. Um, I work with a lot of companies that have legacy code that they're, they want help uh, refactoring. Um, it's one of, the, one of the ways that I pay the bills. And there's, there's no, no count of, of how many legacy systems there are out there that have 500 line long methods that are, you know, have a DB context and every few lines, the DB context is grabbing something from the database. A few lines later, it's calling save changes. A few lines later, it's grabbing some more stuff. And then a few lines later, save changes again. It's really hard to diagnose, debug, refactor that type of code. But if you have a repository abstraction instead, uh, it's much easier for you to have much smaller methods that do larger conceptual things at a time. Um, and, and that same really long 500 line method, you can refactor out into a bunch of smaller little pieces that each do their one responsibility. And then maybe you still have a, a reasonably long method that is sort of like the template that says, okay, do step A, do step B, do step C. Um, but then those other little pieces just work with the repository and, and uh, everything gets a lot smaller and, and componentized, more reusable, easier to, to de debug and, and uh, refactor. Likewise, you get separation of concerns because now your data access isn't commingled with UI or business uh, concerns. Uh, reduces coupling to persistence details. So your application ideally doesn't need to know about Entity Framework or Entity Framework Core or in Hibernate or whatever it is you're using um, everywhere throughout the application. Um, in applications that use the repository, there's probably like, you know, you count them on one hand, number of classes that know about Entity Framework or know about your ORM. Um, Maybe a few more than that if you've got a whole bunch of config files that are configuring your, your database tables, right? Um, but, but they should be really limited, and they should probably only be in one project. So if you have multiple different projects in your system, all the knowledge about your data access implementation details should be in just one of those projects, not scattered through all of them. This, of course, improves testability um, because you can easily separate away the data access concerns from um, everything else, which data access is one of the first things that makes testing hard in legacy systems because you're trying to test what's going on and every few uh, lines of code that you get in a large method, it's hitting a database and you either have to have a test database that's all set up perfectly to be able to execute your test case or you, know, you have to spend a lot of effort trying to, to, to factor that out or mock it out. Um, as soon as you have an abstraction in place, it becomes trivial to, to swap out whatever data you want there um, and, and make the whole method much easier to test. Okay, so there's different approaches to how you want to implement repository. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a topic that could be its own whole, whole session, but I'll just cover a few tips here. So one approach, uh, sort of a real simple approach, is to build a repository per entity. Um, if you're going to follow this approach, it's also probably a good idea to only build the methods that you're using. So this is generally a, a good idea. Uh, it's actually following the interface segregation principle, another solid principle, um, because you're making it so that you only depend on methods you actually use. So like, why would you need to have a delete customer uh, method on a repository if nowhere in your system do you support the concept of being able to delete customers? Um, so so there's, there's some good reason why you might wanna do this. Um, on the downside to this approach, if you have a reasonably large system and it has a large number of entities, you're gonna have a large number of repositories. And it turns out that repository code tends to look pretty repetitive from one repository to the next. Um, so it's a good candidate for using generics. 
And so another approach is to use a generic repository. And a generic repository would just define uh, the common CRUD methods that you would typically use. Um, and then you would implement them. And you can implement them all in a single generic class. Um, so you might have an I repository of, of entity. Um, and then you implement that with an entity framework repository of entity um, generically. And in there, you give it the CRUD methods that you need, the create, read, update, delete, uh, you know, get by ID, list, things like that. Now, if for a particular entity, you need something special, you need more than just get by ID and list, usually it's a query that you need. Sometimes it's something else, like maybe a count or an any or an exists. Um, and it's not something that you need generically for everyone. Um, you can create a specific implementation still and have it inherit from the generic one. So you might have a product repository that inherits from I repository of product. Um, and at runtime, it's going to be this, this product repository that inherits from EF repository of product. Uh, and, and, and then just add the extra methods that you need, you know, get product by region, get product by catalog or something, I don't know. Um, put those extra query methods on that specific repository. Um, so you can keep your generic repository generic, and then individual specific ones can just have their, their query methods. Now, if you've gone down this road, which I have, uh, sometimes you end up with a lot of these methods, right? And it's, it gets frustrating because you're constantly having to go back to, uh, oh, I've got to add yet another uh, method on the product repository. And also, I have to remember that I can't just use um, the generic I repository of product because that's wired up to the EF repository and it doesn't know about those, those extra product specific methods. Um, this product repository here has to have an interface that goes along with it, has to have an I product repository that it, that it implements. Um, and anything that wants to get access to those extra special methods needs to ask for an I product repository, not an I repository of product. And that can lead to some uh, confusion with developers. It can also occasionally lead to bugs where, you know, maybe you have a proxy uh, that you want to insert in there, and we'll talk about those in just a minute. Uh, and you set it up for the generic one, but it's not set up for the non-generic one, for example. Um, and so you get behavior that you're not expecting. So there's another way to do this same thing that's better, in my opinion. Uh, and we'll talk about it before the end of this talk. Now, some other approaches to repositories you can think about. Um, you might want to split your repository interfaces based on whether they're read-only or write-only. Um, this this kind of follows CQRS, uh, Command Query Responsibility Segregation. Um, and one of the things that this would allow you to do uh, is better follow interface segregation principle, because it might be that uh, certain controllers or certain services only need read operations, or they only need write operations. And so asking them to depend on the whole repository uh, interface with all of its functionality um, means it's depending on methods they don't use. Um, interface segregation principle says don't do that. Uh, and so having a smaller um, repository with, with fewer methods on it um, would be good. More, more uh, practically, the reason why you might want to do this is that your iRead repository methods are going to be your get by ID, your list, your other queries. Um, those are really good candidates for caching. Uh, and we're going to talk in a few minutes about how you can easily apply caching with repositories. Um, write operations, they're not great for caching, right? You're not going to cache an insert statement. Um, and so caching doesn't really make sense so much on the right side. But on the right side, the command pattern can sometimes work really well. Maybe you don't want to actually block and wait for this insert to occur during this request. Quest. Maybe instead you want to just write that command to a queue and some other offline process will, will pick that up and, and make sure it gets inserted. But your web request can return immediately because it's queued up that command. Um, you can't really do that with a query, right? You can't really say, hey, I want to load this web page and display all of my, the contents of my shopping cart. Okay, great. I'll put that command on a queue and you know someday some other process will get to it. Like that doesn't work. Um, but you can do that with commands. And so for your writes, um, you can queue up those commands, again, by using uh, a separate implementation of that prox uh, or of that, of that interface. Um, and having those separated interfaces lets you do that a little easier. Uh, it's frequently the case that you want to organize your uh, repositories by bounded context. So if you have multiple bounded contexts in your system, it may make sense to have multiple repositories um, based on that. You may even want to have different DB contexts uh, if you're using Entity Framework um, per bounded context in your system. Uh, you can also organize repositories by aggregate, have different repositories per aggregate, or uh, specify that your aggregates um, are the only thing that repositories will work with, uh, which is something that I, I typically do uh, in my applications. So 
Aggregates are another DDD design pattern that uh, we don't have time to get into today. I cover them in my Pluralsight course, um, but they're a way of, of taking a group of related entities and treating them as a unit when you do data persistence. All right, so considerations. Repositories should return domain objects. What else would they return? Well, um, you, be, you may be tempted to have your repository return back a view model or return back a DTO or return something else where the repository has to map from the data, the data model to something that's in the UI or something that's in uh, some other part of your application. That's not the repository's job, right? The repository's job is to provide a way to get to your domain model. And your domain model is made up of entities, possibly value objects and aggregates and other patterns, but, but entities are the main thing that the repository deals with. Um, and so that's what it should return. That's what the interface should be composed of is entities, not DTOs, not view models. Um, and so that starts to, to come to the question that was asked by uh, C. Hudson, how would you build your interfaces when you're using Entity Framework? Um, well, your interface for your repository, it doesn't know about Entity Framework. It doesn't care if it's Entity Framework. Um, it cares that it's working with the domain model. And so the interfaces that it's going to use are going to return back domain model types. You don't want to return persistent specific types. You don't want to return you know, a SQL data reader from your repository because now you're tightly coupled to a SQL server, right? And if you decided you want to swap that out with a repository that talks to a JSON file or that talks to a NoSQL database, it's going to be really hard to implement that interface when it's expecting a, to return a SQL data reader. Uh, and likewise, you don't want it to be view specific because you're um, your repository abstraction shouldn't know anything about the UI. Uh, it should be totally locked down to your domain model. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the interface and what it should return. Um, you're probably going to have some methods that return lists. Um, you have a few things that you might return here. Um, I recommend returning I enumerable or, or just a list, either one. Um, avoid returning an I queryable of T. Uh, and there's a few reasons for that. So. What, is, what does iQueryable do? Well, iQueryable doesn't actually return the data from the method. Instead, it returns back an expression tree. And that expression tree is still open to additions. So this gives you something called deferred execution, which is a good thing, uh, generally, um, because you could have a repository that returns back, a from a list method, it returns back an iQueryable of, let's say, customers. Um, and if it just returns you back an iQueryable of customer with nothing else, um, then when you enumerate that iQueryable by default, it's just going to give you all the customers. Um, most of the time, that's not what you want. Maybe you just wanted the top 10 customers from Ohio. Okay, so somewhere in your code, you're going to say, give me back this iQueryable, and you're going to append to it, and you're going to say dot where customer dot address dot state equals OH. Right, and then you know, dot take ten. Right, okay. Now I've I've built up that expression. And I've said it's only going to be filtered down to this set, and it's only want this many rows. And then when I say dot two list or dot first or give me the next one or whatever, um, that's when it'll execute. That's when the database query will actually get uh, built and executed. Um, so that's all great. The problem with that is that it encourages you to put your data access code now all over your application. So anywhere in your application, whether it's in a controller or a view or a service or whatever, you're going to have code that's going to say dot where this, dot take that, dot select the other. Um, and all of that gets translated into um, part of that query that Entity Framework is going to execute. Uh, and a lot of the time, it's going to compile just fine, but then it's going to blow up at runtime because Entity Framework can translate some things into SQL logic and other things it really can't, and it'll just blow up. Or you're going to have performance problems where Entity Framework is going to do just fine at compiling and even running your query, but some of that stuff it can't actually run on the database. It only can run it in memory. Uh, that's not necessarily clear to you. Uh, and so at development time, it might work fine, but then at runtime, you actually try and run it in production and that query that took like half a second on your machine with a local SQL database and 10 rows, when it goes on the real machine with a million rows, it's fetching back a million rows and then filtering them all in memory, you know, 10 requests per second. And you wonder why your application falls over. <clears throat> so um, the reason why you want to return back an enumerable or a list is because you want to know that the thing that comes back from your repository is an in-memory set of data. It's an array. It's, it's a list. It's not connected to the database in any way. 
Um, this is specifically advice for web applications, for ASP.NET Core. If you're building a different type of application, um, th then it may not apply. But um, definitely for web applications, I've found this to be the case. So um, this also relates to lazy loading. I'd strongly discourage you from using lazy loading in your web applications because it encourages making lots of small requests back to the database. And when you're trying to return a request um, from the web server to a client, to a browser, um, or to an, if it's an API, it might even be another program. Um, you want it to return in, in you know, tiny amount of milliseconds, not you know, seconds of time. Uh, and if every time it, it needs to go fetch another property off of a, an entity, it needs to go make another database call to get it. You know, every one of those database call is calls is adding tens of milliseconds or more uh, to the time that your request is going to take to return. So, so watch out for that. Um, avoid iQueryable if, if you can. Um, so how and where should you define custom queries? And, and what about lazy loading? I covered that. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about lazy loading in just a second. For custom queries, you got a few options. Uh, and let me, let me point something else out that, that a lot of people miss. Um, because folks that are passionate about DDD, we talk a lot about DDD patterns. We talk about the domain model, the repository, and how to get the entities and all this stuff. Um, but the thing that a lot of times gets overlooked is the, the read model idea. Um, and so all of this stuff with repositories is a way to get the entities in your domain model. So why do you have a domain model? Well, you have a domain model so that you can encapsulate all the custom business logic in your application in one place where it's easy to test and easy to see and there's no duplication. And you know, well, what is business logic? When does that apply? Well, usually business logic applies when you're making changes to the system, right? You wanna know if this customer can add this order to their cart or you wanna know that after they added that order to their cart, what's the total for the cart and are they eligible for this promotion and stuff like that? All right, well, what about if you just wanna display data? What if you've got a search screen on your page? Or what if you've got you know, some report where you just wanna be able to list out like, here's the top 100 customers by country, blah, blah, blah. Um, are you gonna need the domain model for that? Are there business rules that you're gonna run for that that are, that are specific to the domain and not specific to this report? Probably not. So, so when you just wanna get lots of read-only data in a custom way, you don't need to use the domain model for that a lot of the time. Instead, use whatever tool makes sense for you to get that data. You know, use a store procedure, use a custom SQL query, you know, go fetch the data in, in the structure that you need it from and use a, your database for what it's good for. Uh, and then when you wanna return that, if you need a view model or some DTO to bind it to or to pass over the wire, create a custom read model that matches exactly the structure of that, that uh, query result you're gonna get. Um, and use that. And if you need a, an abstraction for that, if you need a custom way to, to build that, create a different abstraction for it. Don't try and put your custom queries um, that are just for read-only data, that are just for reports or things like that. Don't try and drive those through your repository and make yourself insane trying to get EF Core to do what it's supposed to do. Just write a store procedure, create something to bind it to, and and use Dapper or use EF Core, you know, straight database access, um, and, and be done in, in half an hour instead of wasting hours on it. Okay, so um, Tony Davis asked, do you always put repository interfaces in a separate project from their implementation, a la clean architecture, even for small projects with one interface? Um, yeah, if, if I have code that I'm gonna try and ship uh, and code that I wanna test, then I'm gonna follow the dependency inversion principle and I'm gonna make it so that my implementations depend on my interface. Um, if I build all that in one project and I can, um, the problem is that it's, it's more difficult to enforce that rule. Um, and so it doesn't hurt me any to, to start with a three project solution where I've got web infrastructure and core. Um, and I built the clean architecture template to make that stupid easy. Um, so, so yeah, every time I build something new, uh, it takes me literally less than five minutes to create a new clean architecture solution. And then I know right where everything is. Um, and it, and it, you know, it's like I'm falling into the pit of success from day one. Um, whereas if I start with just a single file new web project and I put everything in there, in like folders or whatever, um, eventually I'm probably gonna wanna break it up into projects. And at that point, it may be all mungled together. It may be that I didn't follow my rules as well as I wanted to, or maybe I have a team and they don't know the rules and so everything is all over the place. Um, so I'd much rather kind of start off on the right path um, because it doesn't take that much effort to, to set it up correctly uh, as opposed to trying to clean it up later. Uh, okay. Farber Jr. says, this slide is a little misleading because you list iQueryable and are saying not to do that. Um, yeah, this was meant to be, that's a good point. Let me, let me edit this slide. Uh, let's, let's say this says or that, and we'll put some question marks on there and we'll make that bold and 
then we'll do no we'll do that and then we'll do that and look at that real-time updates all right is that better i think you're right so yes you're correct that was misleading and that's my fault um, but i'm agile so i fixed it all right uh let's talk about lazy loading um get those okay so question for you i wrote a simple page that uses lazy loading um, a few years ago. Did it with Entity Framework 6 and Entity Framework Core with its new lazy loading support. Um, and basically built a, a conference website uh, where it would display the sessions that were available for the conference. And it would say who the speakers were and it would say what tags exist for these sessions. And so the sum total of all the data for this conference website is shown on this screenshot. Um, you go to the sessions view, and on that view, there is some code that will read from the DB context. Um, and, and using lazy loading, it will fetch all the sessions. And then on those sessions, it will check the author. And it will also check, uh, not the author, the speaker. Um, and it will also list the tags, right? So the total amount of data in this database are three sessions, two speakers, and two tags. And you can see how they're associated on this slide. My question for you is, how many database calls does this make when you run it? And you can answer in the chat if you want, or you can just think to yourself, come up with a number, all right? Remember, there's there's three sessions, two speakers, two tags. Here's the code. It's saying, go get me the session that's in the model, uh, that you know, gives a list of sessions, and then show me the name, and then get speaker sessions, select the names, speaker session tags, select the tag name, all right? This is all the code, and show the description, all right? This takes 22 queries with lazy loading. It gets worse if you have more data. Um, so, so you don't necessarily want to use lazy loading in your ASP.NET applications because uh, you're going to just be super chatty as heck with the uh, with the database. Uh, and I think this one is um, just EF6, not EF core. I don't think I had this for EF core, actually. Um, but I might have updated the GitHub repo at some point. I'm not sure. In any case, um, and it may not be this bad with with EF Core. Um, they maybe they've tuned it a little bit, um, but it's still much worse than one, right? How many how many database calls should you have to make to display this page, right? You should have to make one. I would also accept zero um, because this page is heavily cacheable, uh, and so if you already have made that database request at some point in the recent past, there's no reason for you to make it again, right? Zero would be the, the a good answer for 99% of the requests to this page. All right. Uh, let's talk about how you can stack patterns. So stacking patterns is how you get, you know, a lot of bang for your buck because you know about a few design patterns and you can stack them together to get some really cool results. So the, the easy one and the one that you're probably already familiar with, but I'll show it to you anyway, um, is that you can stack using the strategy pattern and the repository pattern and you can dependency inject a repository. Um, and these days that seems pretty obvious, but back in the MVC3 days, this was a music store sample that uh, Microsoft shipped with ASP.MVC3. You know, they would just new up a DB context inside the controller uh, and then just start using the thing. Uh, and a lot of this type of code still exists because this is how Microsoft said to do it, so it must be right. Um, in here, you want to basically refactor this and say, okay, I want to create an interface that has just the code I need, um, pull that out. And then I'm going to take the uh, the actual code that's in my controller, and I'm going to put it into a new class that implements this interface, and that's what this would be. Uh, and then I'm going to take my controller, I'm going to inject the interface using the strategy pattern. So I'm using a repository because the, the code that I'm uh, extracting out is data access code. So I'm going to name this service a repository. If it was doing something else, I would name it something else. I'd name it an iAlbum service or whatever. Um, but because it's data access code, I'm going to call it a repository. Uh, and I'm going to implement it with Entity Framework in this case. So my implementation is going to be called an EF album repository to differentiate it from a MongoDB album repository or a, you know whatever other data store I want to use uh, repository. Um, and then I just inject it, and this should look pretty familiar to you if you're if you're familiar with constructor dependency injection, um, and and everything works great, right? Now my controller is a little bit cleaner. Um, if you look at the controller now, this this code here in the bottom left of your screen, um, notice that it does not have an instance of the new keyword, right? 
before we were newing up the DB context and that's why we were tightly coupled to it. Now that, that keyword doesn't even exist. Um, it doesn't exist in the EFM repository either. Nowhere in this whole set of code is there a new keyword um, because that's not the responsibility of any of this code. That's the responsibility of the IOC container that's gonna be creating that controller. All right, this comes back, I think, to, uh, to Tony's question of where repositories live uh, relative to their interfaces, relative to other uh, parts of your code. Um, if you're following the Onion architecture or clean architecture, um, you might have uh, different projects like core, uh, infrastructure, and web are typically what I have. Um, and so you want to place your interfaces for your repository in core. Um, remember, the repository is the interface. And, and the a repository interface is part of your domain model. It's describing how you're going to get access to your domain model. Um, and so it lives with your domain model. It lives in the, the core of your application. Um, that core project should have few, if any, dependencies uh, and no dependencies on things that talk to infrastructure, things that talk to databases, file systems, networks, et cetera, stuff like that. You take a quick drink. All right, the implementation, the thing that actually knows about a database or a data store um, goes into infrastructure and the infrastructure project references core. And that's why that implementation of that interface is able to live in the infrastructure project and reference the, the interface that it implements. Uh, and then you're gonna have a UI layer, which is typically where your app you know, entry point is. Um, and it references core as well. Um, it references infrastructure at runtime. It has to, because it has to use those types. Uh, it doesn't have to use, reference infrastructure at compile time. Typically it will, because it's just easier that way. Um, but it's worth noting that you can build your application such that your UI project, your web project, has a reference to core and has no compile time reference to infrastructure. All right, just drop that project reference. Um, all you have to do to make that work is add a post compile action that says copy the infrastructure DLL from its bin folder into the web project bin folder. And at runtime, your IOC container or your configure services just loads those types from that DLL. Why would you want to do that? Well, it makes it so that your developers, um, if, if, if they're prone to doing the wrong thing or if, or if you don't trust them, um, it keeps them from using types from infrastructure directly in the web project because they can't, right? There's no reference to it. And all you have to do is keep an eye on that web project file um, and just make sure that if that, uh, that project reference ever appears, you know, during a code review, you see it show up, you just get rid of it, right? Nope. Nope, sorry, web project does not reference infrastructure project. That doesn't happen. Um, and that will keep you from getting this tight coupling from your UI project to your, your infrastructure project. All right, um, no other questions that I've missed, it looks like. I think I answered the question on how you'd build interfaces with Entity Framework, so I think I covered that. Uh, this is it for repositories for now. We'll talk some more about some other related stuff in a minute. Um, but we're going to shift gears now and talk about the proxy. So the proxy design pattern uh, is basically to have this, this intermediary um, that stands in between a client and, and a resource. Um, and so an example here that, that I stole from Wikipedia um, is for someone to, to ask the proxy to, to say, hey, ask Jonas, Jonas what time it is, and then it does, and then Jonas gives the answer, and the proxy gives the answer back. Um, so we use this design pattern all the time uh, inside our, of software to, to stand in for some other resource or to prevent uh, or control access to another resource. And so it's a class that controls access to another, can be implemented by a subclass or through delegation um, by sharing a common interface. Uh, and we frequently use it for things like remote proxies for uh, web services or, or network calls. Um, lazy loading, frequently we use a proxy. So if you do turn on lazy loading in Entity Framework, uh, there's two ways to do it. One uses a service and the other uses a proxy. Um, the service is the way to go if you wanna keep dependencies out of your entities. Um, Sorry, the proxy. The proxy is the way to go if you want to keep dependencies out of your entities. Um, the proxy is invisible to you uh, unless you're debugging and at runtime you want to see what these types are. But you have to make your, your entity properties virtual um, because what's going to happen is at, uh, at runtime, Entity Framework is going to wrap your, your code with a, a subclass that is a proxy, um, it'll override those those properties. And when someone goes to ask for that property, right, when you've got a customer and you wanna say, hey, give me its orders, right, that virtual orders collection 
um, is actually a, a proxy that Entity Framework has placed there that's going to go off and make a database call to get that set of orders right at that instant, right at that moment, as you're trying to enumerate those orders um, and block until it comes back. And when it comes back, then it's going to be like, oh, you mean these orders? And, and, and finish that request. Um, and so that's how lazy loading works typically is, is through the use of proxies. Um, you can also use them for security and access control because they control access to another resource. So the typical structure for this, um, this looks really similar actually to the strategy design pattern. So you've got um, a client uh, that depends on an interface. Um, in the case of the strategy pattern, it was uh, the, the, the context that had this, this interface uh, as part of it. But in this case, um, client's going to make a call to this interface. Um, and when it makes a call to the subject, um, it's going to talk to either the real subject or the proxy. Um, and which one is, is a matter of, of what the compiler gives it or what the IOC container decides to use. Um, so it can swap in either one. Either one can stand in for the other. Um, alternately, uh, the proxy could just be a subclass of the real subject. Uh, that's, that's less flexible because it's tightly coupled to that one subject at that point. Um, but that is another way that you can do the pattern. Here's what strategy looks like just for, for comparison. So it's really, really similar. Um, all right, and then, so then the bonus uh, pattern that we're gonna talk about here is the decorator pattern. Um, and so the decorator pattern looks like, uh, do I have it? No, I, I just have an animation that moves things. Um, the decorator pattern looks exactly like the proxy. Uh, I don't know what happened to my image. I forgot to, to fix it at some point. But, but right here where it says proxy, pretend that says decorator, because that's the only difference. Um, and so the, the main difference with the decorator is the intent. The UML is the same, the structure is the same, but the intent of a decorator is to add behavior to another class, whereas the intent of the proxy is to control access to it. Um, and so sometimes, you know, you can kind of go either way with that. So let's talk about caching again. Um, caching is, is uh, one of the best things you can do to your application to implement, um, or sorry, to improve its performance. Um, you know, you might be able to tweak some some string concatenation here, or or, or change some uh, some loop to to move some stuff out of it and make the loop a little bit faster, and you know, squeeze out a couple percentage points of uh, performance for your for your whole request. If you add caching, you can take something and and you know, make it a hundred times faster, because you're you're literally getting rid of a ton of the work that it's doing with out of process calls, and so all of that little you know tiny little micro feedback uh, improvements you're making to uh, your code. Um, just pales in significance to if you can get rid of database calls uh, in almost every app. Um, so caching is, is something you should definitely be thinking about, uh, especially if you have an application that, that tends to ask for the same data again and again and again, which is most applications for at least some types of data, right? If you have an application that has certain lookup tables that it frequently needs to get that are just like populating dropdown lists or um, being used as, uh, as statuses for, um, for another entity, um, those things are, are super heavily cacheable. Um, and they almost never change, right? They're read mostly data, so they're a good candidate for caching. Um, let me pause for just a minute. I see another question. How is proxy different from mediator? So uh, it's, it's different because mediator is a, a way to pass messages between two things without them having to know about each other, whereas proxy um, just controls access to a specific resource. You're not going to use a proxy and not know what it's doing uh, and be like, oh, well, that proxy could be talking to anything. Like the proxy is, is specifically to a particular uh, resource that you're trying to get to. Um, and you might think you're actually talking to that particular resource, whereas the proxy is, is invisible to you and standing in, the, in between. Whereas with the mediator, you, you could talk to mediator, you'd be like, mediator.send this command or mediator.publish this event. And you have no idea what happens after that. Like, mm, something's going to handle that or not. I don't know. Um, but it's not like you're specifically intending to, to trigger a specific class um, or, or thing to happen with Mediator, um, if that makes sense. So, so that's, that's uh, the best description I've got right now of how they're different. All right, let me jump back into caching. So um, caching is frequently added to query methods. I already talked about how you could split your repository into read, uh, read-only methods that, that are more cacheable. So this would, this would apply to that. Um, and caching logic is a separate concern. Uh, it's easy to get caching logic wrong. Uh, it's something that you might want to change how you do it uh, later. And if you change your mind about how you want to do caching, you're probably changing that, that decision 
for totally different reasons and different at a different time than changing your decision about how you're going to fetch the data or what data access technology you're going to use. So they're definitely separate concerns. Data access concern is one thing. Caching is a separate concern. So you don't want to put them in the same class. You don't want to just go into your repository, your data access library, and just start adding caching to all your methods that fetch data because you're going to have a lot of repetition. Um, all your methods are going to get bigger and more complex and have a bunch of if statements in them. Um, and they're mostly going to look the same. Uh, so you're going to be you know, breaking the don't repeat yourself principle. And then when they're different, it's going to be hard to detect if they're different because they're supposed to be or because you screwed up and you actually made a change in most of the places but forgot it in one. Um, these are all reasons not to store all your caching logic with your data access logic. Instead, let's make it a separate class. All right, so is that separate class going to be a proxy or is it going to be a, de a decorator? They're both exactly the same in terms of the function, the structure of how we're going to do the pattern. Um, but a proxy uh, provides this way to control access to something. In this case, if we're using caching, we're going to control whether you get access to the real data or whether we just give you the cache data. Um, so definitely it's a proxy in this case. But wait, the decorator adds functionality or behavior to something. In this case, we're going to add some caching behavior on top of our existing data access behavior. So I think it's definitely the decorator. Um, you could go either way. Uh, in olden times, I, I was thinking it was a proxy. Um, and more recently, I've, I've kind of come around and think, nah, I think decorator describes it better. Um, but, but either one, you you could make a case for. All right, so here's an example of a proxy slash decorator version of a repository. This is that same repository that you saw earlier that was that one method al album repository that all it does is get the top selling albums. Um, now we're wrapping that with a caching implementation layer and it does all this logic in here to do caching. And you can see there's some complexity and some locks and some if statements and other stuff um, to, to do caching right. Uh, and then right here on this line, uh, is where it's going to go and, and actually fetch the underlying data. So if it gets to that line, what that means is it wasn't in the cache, so go get it from the database. Uh, and then as soon as you do, insert it into the cache, right? And in this case, it's hard-coded to, to be in there for 60 seconds. Um, probably that would be you know something we'd specify in a config file or something. Um, okay, so to implement this, uh, there, there's, a, there's a problem that you should see here if you're using your default uh, IOC container, like what you get with uh, the services collection, where you say um, services dot add scoped I album repository comma cached album repository, right? Like that would be your syntax that you would do. Um, and so if you did that, what would be the problem you would get with this implementation right here? And if this were an in-person user group, uh, someone would yell it out and I would hear you and it'd be great. But um, since it's a, a Twitch stream, I'm just gonna pause for a minute and let you think about it and say, mm, I don't know, what's, what's, the, what's he trying to tell me here? Um, and then I'm just gonna give you the answer, which is, okay, when your IOC container tries to create any type, in this case, a cache down repository, um, it's going to look and see if it can populate its dependencies. So if you have a controller, let's say, and the controller says, I need an iAlbum repository, what's going to happen is it's going to look at its dictionary and it's going to say, I have a dictionary and my rule says, if somebody needs an iAlbum repository, I'm going to give you a cache down repository. Perfect. Great. Let me go create one of those. And it says, all right, I've got a cache down repository. Can I create it? No, it needs something. What does it need? It needs an iAlbum repository. All right, let me go look at my dictionary. What does that mean? Ah, I need to get a, uh, hey, Choco Taco is live. Um, I need to get a, uh, a cached album repository to implement that. Great. Can I create one of those? No, it's got a constructor. It needs an album repository. Okay, repeat that infinitely. Uh, and so you'll, you'll see there's an infinite loop here um, because a cached album repository is an album repository and it needs an album repository. Now, I can get around that in two ways. One, I could say, you know what? I know this thing always only works with the Entity Framework album repository. I'll just ask for that, right? And then as long as I've registered the Entity Framework album repository in my services collection, everything will work beautifully and it'll be fine. Um, but if you want to use a more flexible proxy pattern, um, you can do something like this where you can say, I'm going to add a scoped item for iAlbum repository. It's going to be a cached album repository. And then you can pass in a Lambda for the constructor of your type. Um, and you don't see this very often. You don't usually need it. Uh, other IOC containers have, have nicer implementations of this um, that actually support proxy or decorator like like natively, like you just use the word proxy or decorator. Um, in this case, you have to, to kind of do it by hand and say, OK, well, when you go to create this thing, do this to create it. Um, and so I'm going to say, go get me an EF album repository um, from 
the the context here uh, and then create a new cache job repository with that uh, is how you tell it to do that. All right. Um, I have an article on how to do this in ASP.NET Core. Uh, so if you just Google or, or grab the URL, it's in the, in the screen right here, um, building a cached repository in ASP.NET Core um, on our Dallas.com. It covers everything you need to know to do it there. Uh, and that's what I've got for repositories. So now, last one we're gonna talk about is specification. Um, specification is another cool pattern that works really well with the repository. Um, what specification is all about is defining queries as objects. Um, and what happens when you take queries and you define them as objects um, is you, you end up with uh, these well-named objects that, that represent individual queries. Uh, they're very reusable. Um, if you used to do a lot of work with database-driven applications and you use store procedures for, for a lot of things, um, you may have found that it was great, uh, at least up to a certain point, right? It was great that your store procedures provided this library of functionality and you could just say, hey, I need to do this thing. Does that exist? Uh, yeah, there it is, store procedure does that thing. Perfect, I'll use that. Um, eventually, that tends to fall over because you get really, really, really big database with too many store procedures to, to scan through. Um, but it's great while it lasts, right? With these specification objects, um, they're part of your domain model and you can organize them however makes sense to you. So if you wanna keep them with your aggregates that they apply to, or you wanna keep them all in one specifications folder and then maybe have subfolders to group them or whatever, you know, it's totally up to you, but they're just part of your domain model. The other thing is, is that since they're part of your domain model, they're totally separate from your, your data access. Um, they're an abstraction. They're a way for you to specify uh, which, which objects you should uh, match or not uh, from a given collection. Um, and so you can use specifications not just for database queries. You can also use them for things like validation uh, or, or deciding if something is fit for a given purpose um, in addition. but. Um, in the context of this presentation, we're going to apply them to repositories. Uh, they do a really good job of separating responsibility from repositories. So if you have a repository that has uh, a whole bunch of additional query methods on it, which I just said a few slides ago was a good way to go, um, this cleans that up so that you don't have to have that anymore. And you can go back to having just one repository, uh, one generic repository that works for everything. And then specifications give you the flexibility you need to do custom queries when you need to. So here's an example of a specification um, from the, the eShop on web sample that Microsoft um, has. If you just Google for eShop on web, it's out there. I, I maintain it uh, along with a couple other people. Um, and so what this does is it basically defines the filters that the homepage of that app uses. And on that homepage, there's a search box where you can pick and say, I only wanna get catalog items um, that are for this particular brand or the, this type of thing. Um, and so that's what this this brand ID and this type ID are are all about. Um, and so it, it filters down the catalog items uh, based on that. And so you can see it's it's catalog items because that's here in the uh, in the uh, generic base specification that it's doing. Um, the other thing it does is it, it represents what should be included with this. So when we talked about repository, we talked about custom queries. We didn't even talk about how you include stuff, um, which is a whole other pain point that folks have when they use Entity Framework through a repository, uh, is that you know now there's there's no easy way to say, I wanna get this type and I wanna include its navigation property. I wanna include this other collection that it, that it references. Um, that's not necessarily easy to do through a repository without adding additional methods to it. Um, this gives you a way to do that and not have to add more methods in order to achieve it. Um, specification usage, this is um, how you might use a, a specification uh, inside of a, another method. So you've got a list method that takes in a specification. Um, you can take create a queryable result um, that has all the includes that the specification has and then create a, a secondary result and then you know say where with, with some criteria. So this is just a, an example of a, of a really simple way to use specification. Um, if we look at the, the NuGet package, and, and hopefully we have some time, I'd like to, to show it. Um, I'll show you some, some more uh, actual samples in, in some code. Um, but it's pretty easy to, to do this, and, and the real one has uh, a bunch more features than just this. Um, you can use this NuGet package yourself. You can just grab it. It's on version 4.1 um, out there on NuGet.org is our Dallas.specification. Uh, and some of the features that it has are, uh, you know, obviously filtering, but also you can do ordering, you can do include, including nested includes, you can do include this, then include that. Um, you can select, so you can get custom projections of data from it, uh, supports paging and supports caching. 
Uh, it doesn't do the caching, but it supports uh, you specifying whether or not it it's, uh, supports caching. And then you can build your cache key in the specification, which is the right place to put it, because the specification knows all the different things that should be used to compose a cache key. All right, so let me just wrap this up with uh, talking a little bit about pain-driven development, and then we'll we'll see what questions there are. Uh, and if folks want to see some code, I'd, I'll be happy to, to pull up specification uh, or, or any of the other samples I've got. Um, so pain-driven development is basically a way of saying, don't try to apply every pattern that you know up front. Um, instead, wait until you experience some pain uh, that this design pattern is designed to solve. Uh, and so if you recognize that there's this this pain, you've got this tight coupling, you've got this difficulty to test, you've got the you know separation of concerns is all wrong and it's causing you pain and problems, then then try a design pattern that's designed to fix that problem. All right, so we can respond to pain with the appropriate design pattern and some refactoring. So so let's say we start out and we have a really simple controller. And the simple controller um, just instantiates DB context in it, uh, makes some query, returns some results. Um, and the problem with this is that because we're just instantiating a DB context, which um, you really should never do, it's supposed to be scoped, uh, you may have bugs, right? And so the very first thing you should do here is don't do that. Um, instead, you should be injecting that DB context through the constructor, let the services collection manage that lifetime for you. It's gonna do the right thing. It's gonna create it as scoped. Um, and so you're gonna use the strategy pattern and this dependency injection to alleviate the pain that those EF core bugs were giving you because you were instantiating it directly. All right, now we've got this problem where I'm injecting the DB context, I make some queries, um, but I'm duplicating this code to perform similar data access between different controllers and actions. I've got tight coupling to all my data access details. Um, I would like to be able to uh, fix that and have a way to kind of reuse that code and not have to do it again and again and again uh, inside every controller. Um, and so I can inject in a repository pattern interface to kind of stand in for those database, those low level specific database commands I want to make. Um, and now I can take that, that implementation detail of how to make those queries and I can put it in just one place. Um, and so I have less code overall and my code inside my controllers is at a higher level of abstraction and it's easier to understand. Um, so I'm responding to this, this duplicate code and this tight coupling pane by using a repository pattern. All right, now if I need better performance, I can go and I can add the decorator on top of this. So if I've got all these, these uh, controller actions, they're using repositories, they're fetching data, but that data doesn't change very often. My database got popular, or my website got popular, so my database got popular, um, and it's making a lot more requests, uh, serving a lot more queries than it would like. Um, you can use the decorator and add caching to it really easily. There's other ways that you can add caches in other places inside your application. This is just one of them. Um, they all have trade-offs, but this is a pretty easy one for you to put in place. And it's very granular, right? You can say, I only wanna put the caching in for the lookup tables that I know don't change, right? Cause I don't wanna have the risk of my data being out of sync where the cache is, is old or something like that. Now let's say you've, you've bought into the repository uh, but you have a lot of custom queries. So you have get entity by this, get entity with that. Um, and so you know, the repositories just keep getting bigger and bigger and you wanna fix that. Um, so you can do that by using the specification pattern. So if you apply the specification pattern to the repository pattern, you end up with having only two patterns to use for all your data access. Repository basically is done, it's stable. You never have to touch it again. You have one generic repository for everything. And where you add more code, whenever you have a new query to make or a new way that you wanna shape the data, is you create a new specification. Um, and so what this means is that when you're updating your application, you're making changes, you're mostly making those changes in new classes, which is definitely where you'd rather be than changing existing code. Because whenever you're working with new classes, you're free to implement them however you want. Nothing else is gonna break based on how you make that decision because nothing else uses them yet. Um, and so it's a much better place to be when you're doing maintenance than trying to edit code that a whole lot of stuff already talks to. All right. Um, I have a list of references here. I can take some time and, and do some questions. Uh, I don't know if if, uh, if I'm going too long or if this is about right or if people want to hang around for a bit. Um, but if you want, I can definitely walk through some code and show some demos too. So what do, what do you guys think? I think we're, we're comfortable going as long as you're comfortable going. Uh, we still have a pretty solid audience out there. So we're looking for additional questions. Uh, if anybody has any anything specific they would like to to ask or see um i have been using the 
you know, uh, so C Hudson saying code and demos. Uh, I've I've been enjoying the specification pattern. I've I've been using that on one of my personal projects. Yeah, I've I've seen John using the pattern, and um, like just at a first glance, um, it was a bit alien. So I wouldn't mind a walkthrough of that. Sure, let me go ahead and uh, pull that up. Um, in fact, I'll start with the the eShop on web. Um, project because that's got them built in so let me let me find that we've come to the free consulting part of the show nobody nobody's asking specific code questions so we're, we're good All right, forgive me for my light theme. I was doing a bunch of screenshots and I needed them to be printable. I didn't want to kill the printer, so I switched to a light theme. Um, but here is the uh, eShop, yeah, yeah, uh, eShop on web project. And I'm gonna just close all tabs for now and go to a high level view here. And so out of the box, uh, used to just have uh, three, three projects, but we added Blazor support um, over the summer, uh, and that added a few more projects because Blazor needed to have its own front end app, which is Blazor Admin. You needed to have another project to share types between the, the front end and the back end, so that's Blazor Shared. And then we needed to give it a set of APIs to talk to, and it turned out that was much easier and better to do as a separate project than trying to manage APIs in the same project as the existing MVC web app. Um, and so we created an API project. Um, but but the web project I'm going to show you is basically just the, uh, the application core infrastructure and web. We'll set this as startup and just run it real quick. Ooh, there's an update. There were build errors. Why were there build errors? Oh, I've seen this one. This is a wonky build icon one. What is, what is the fix for that? Static web assets, conflicting, what was that? This is some bug that's not related to my code that came up, and let me Google for it real quick. I've fixed it a couple times on other projects already. Do you guys know? Have you seen this one? Uh, my first step with that kind of stuff is is clean and rebuild, but I don't know if that'll fix it for you. That's a good uh, good try. I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think deleting the OBJ folder was the, was the fix for this, now that you mention it. I don't know if Visual Studio Clean will do that. It's doing a lot of cleaning of Docker stuff, apparently. Um, but we'll, we'll try that. Meanwhile, uh, let's go over here. I'm just going to delete the uh, obj and bin folders directly also, because I don't think VS Clean does that by default. And also this, what do I do here? I think I must have just been messing around with that, maybe? I don't know. Let's see if it builds. And no. Now it can't find any of these. What? All right. Let's try this as a different project. So. I'm going to go this other one that I know works, which is the exact same solution, uh, but just another fork of it that I was working on. And so it's going to look really similar. And here it is. And if this one doesn't work, I'm going to be really perturbed because this I was working on a couple hours ago and it was fine. Uh, and we will close all tabs. Go away. Close all tabs, sweet, and close these things. All right, and get rid of this, and get rid of that, go away. All right, now we will try and build it this time, and it's going to work. And it does. Haha, -ha. much applause. All right, now we run the thing, and it does its thing, and there it is. Yay, all right, let me pull this up where you can see it. Okay, so here's the app. All right, this is the eShop on web sample. Um, it's got a catalog of products. There's 10 to 12 products. You can see there's paging here. It knows how many pages there are. You can do next and you can do previous. It's very exciting. Um, you can filter down on what brand you want here. 
and say, I'm really interested in .NET stuff. And then you can hit this and it'll filter and you just see .NET and you can say, well, I really just want uh, shirts. So let's just look at shirts. Okay, here's just your shirts. Um, and you notice the paging reflects that, you know, it knows that there's the three matching products. You're on page one of one, the next uh, link doesn't work. All the stuff that you would expect to work uh, is working. So how does that work with a specification? Well, uh, let's start by where we enter into this thing um, on the home page, And that is actually with this index page. Uh, and so the index page, this is using uh, a mix of different uh, UI technology. So it's got MVC and Razor pages in here, uh, basically just to show that you can use either one. Um, and so the, uh, the, the home page is using a Razor page. The Razor page just has this on get method. If you haven't used Razor pages for, for view-based stuff, you really ought to check it out because it's way nicer organization of stuff than having uh, controller with a view, with a view model, uh, typically in like different folders all over the place inside your solution explorer. Um, with Razor Pages, like the view is right here, the model is right here, the action method is right here. Like they're all together. So when I want to work on this page with this view, with this action method, they're all in one place. I don't have to go jumping all over the place inside the solution explorer. So in here, this thing uses a, a service um, to get the, the items it needs. The reason why it's using a service and not a repository is because the main job that this service does is translate from the domain model to uh, the view model that it needs. Um, and so this, this catalog model that it's going to render on the page is a view model, um, and it has all the data that it needs to populate drop-down lists and show the list of items and all that stuff. Um, and the view model service does that, and that's why the view model is right in its name. Right? Its job is to create and return a view model. Um, so if we look at services, we're going to see the catalog uh, view model service right here um, does that. And so this particular one um, has a few different repositories that it needs. These all get injected into its constructor um, and it does some logging. It does some thing with URLs. Uh, and its main method is this get catalog items method. Um, and so if you look at the catalog items method, you're going to see that here is where specifications are being used. There, there's two of them in this case. There's a specification for what is your filter, and then there's a specification that's for the specific page that we're on. And the reason why we need both of those is because we need to know exactly what we're showing on this page with the paginated filter, um, but we also need to know the total number of items. And for that, we need to issue a count. Um, and that's gonna use this other specification that's not taking into account paging, it's the whole data set. Um, but now the, the actual calls to the repository are just a call to list and a call to count, um, and they pass in the appropriate specification. Um, and so you know, your data access logic inside of this method is, is pretty limited, right? It, there's twice as much as there is in most methods just because of the fact that we have both the count and the, and the uh, page specific one. Um, but there's basically the specification here and then the call to the repository here. Um, and then at that point, you've got uh, your domain model types, your entities, um, back from that. So this items on page uh, is my set of entities. And if we look at the var here, you can see it's a uh, read-only list of um, something, of, of whatever it is we're getting. I guess it's uh, catalog items, I would guess. I'm surprised that doesn't show me that. Oh, there it is. T is catalog item. There you go. So it does show it to you. You just have to read all the way to the bottom. Um, okay, so then uh, in here, we want to create the view model, and it just does a bunch of mapping uh, on that. Uh, needs to get the brands, and so it calls these helper methods down here to get the brands. Um, and you don't have to use their specification if you don't have any querying to do. So when I want to get a list of brands, I just say, give me a list of all the brands. Right? It's a lookup table. I want to see all of them. I don't need a specification. I just say, give me the list. Um, but when you need to filter stuff, then it's, it's nice to have the specification. OK, so that's how you use it. And, and there's a few of them used in different places. Let's look at these specifications themselves. So this catalog filter specification um, basically is triggered off of those dropdown lists that I showed you to filter down by the brand or, or type of item. Um, and since these are part of the domain model, they're inside the application core project. If we look at the dependencies for this, you'll see that there's very few dependencies. Um, depends on guard clauses and specification, the functional extensions I added uh, and mediator. Uh, I think I just added. Um, so I think the, the one that's out there in production doesn't even have some of these. But notably, it does not depend on Azure. It does not depend on Entity Framework. It does not depend on SQL Server. There's no infrastructure that it depends on. These are all just pure code libraries that it talks to. So in the specifications folder, uh, we're going to find 
all the specifications this thing uses. There's a catalog filter one. Let's look at it right here. Um, and these are, are really small, right? They're just representing a query. And, and most of the queries that we're talking about pulling out tend to be pretty small anyway, right? It's, it's a where clause and, a, and an order by or, or, a, or something like that. Um, so it's, it's not a lot of data that we're typically pulling into one of these. The benefit isn't that these things have tons and tons of, of code in them. The benefit is that they're reusable, they have a nice name, um, they, they keep our repositories from growing out of control and they keep data access logic from being scattered all through our application. Um, and, and so here, this query uh, is, is exactly what you would have put if you just had an iQueryable or even a DB context inside of that service uh, instead. So we just say dot where, and then we specify the condition that we care about. Okay, and then what about the paginated one, the one that's gonna just get the, the paging, uh, the items on the page that we care about. Here, we're gonna take, uh, pass in the skip and the take, and then we're gonna say, you know, paginate this with skip and take. Um, this method's actually obsolete, so what we would change it to now would be like literally skip, skip, and then take, take, right, like that. Uh, and then we'd get rid of this because we, we recently, in a later version of this, we got rid of the paginate one um, so that we could just have uh, parity with with the, the expected link commands that people are familiar with. Um, but that's it, right? So that's how you do that. Uh, if you want to do includes, uh, you just say dot include, right? So uh, like I mentioned, one of the things that's often a pain point for repositories is being able to say, I want to get my customer. Okay, that's great. But the... Uh, the navigation properties, none of them are populated. Oh, well, okay, let me let me add another method to my repository called get customer with orders. Get customer with orders with order items. Get customer with addresses and orders and order items. Like you have to add a different method overload for every one of those different ways that you might want to pull in all the data. Um, you can put all that in your specification. So, you know, if you want to say, I want to get the basket with its items, um, you know, do that right here. If you're using the aggregate design pattern, you usually want to have um, all of the uh, navigation properties loaded with your aggregate so that your aggregate is, is in its full, fully loaded state. Um, so you could have a specification that, that references the fact that it's grabbing the whole aggregate uh, and use some naming convention for that. So it's very clear that this is the specification to use when you want to get the whole aggregate. Sometimes you might not want to get the whole thing because maybe you're just trying to display some data um, and it's easier to just grab, you know, just the customer and not the customer with all the things um, for performance reasons, let's say. Um, so, so that gives you a lot of flexibility with that. Uh, how specification gets implemented. Um, let me pull that up in another browser here. So, uh, our Dallas dot specification. Do that. Do that. Uh, is Fasini still here? He was. He was helping me quite a bit with this, um, and I've been uh, streaming about it some. Uh, sometimes with his help as a guest. Uh, but in here is where this is actually implemented. Um, go full screen. And yeah, go away. So it's it's pretty straightforward. So inside of the specification, there is a, a base specification that you can use. Uh, and it is where we specify the, the query. I shouldn't say specify in here. Um, but on here, we, we just keep track of all the where expressions, all the includes that you're going to have, um, what are you taking and skipping and whether paging is enabled. Um, there's this thing for doing selection. So you can say dot select, uh, you know, this other uh, shape of the data that you want to get um, and pass all that in. Most of this stuff works without entity framework. So you can use it with any in-memory collection and it works just fine. Um, you could build uh, a provider for it that worked with a different ORM if you wanted to. Uh, and then there's a related package, which is the Entity Framework Core specific one. And inside the EF Core one, um, there's a few other pieces in here that, that only work with uh, EF Core. Uh, and so that's where all the include stuff takes place. Um, like if you're using the in-memory provider, you don't need to worry about include because it's in memory. Everything's included. There's there's no notion of of not loading uh, related members. Uh, but when you fetch it from an actual database, then you have to be specific about what you're including or not. Uh, and so these things, uh, the include stuff, is only something that makes sense for Entity Framework. Um, and and also it's something that you can't really unit test. You have to integration test it against a real database to get that to work. Uh, I see another question to ask, would you suggest any rule engine libraries? Um, I've seen nrule uh, as one. I haven't used it, though. Uh, and so in, in some of my research, I've done 
I, I've seen that one. Uh, I do have a design pattern course uh, on Pluralsight called Rules Engines that kind of teaches you how to build your own simple rules engine. So you could certainly check that out. Um, and if you don't have Pluralsight, but you still want to see my code, you can go to github.com, like our Dallas, and go to my repositories that I have a couple of, 188 of public ones. Um, and in here, you can go to design patterns with C sharp right here. And this has all of my samples from all of my GitHub course, uh, sorry, all my Pluralsight courses um, that I've been doing in the last couple of years, uh, including this this uh, rules engine one. So if you want to see how to how to implement a rules engine with some actual code, you can go check that out here if you like. Um, and then you know go watch the Pluralsight course because that's how I get paid. All right, other other questions? Uh, so is there any specific? That's you asking it. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John, for uh, posting that link. Um, I should probably post a link to the uh, plural site course in here too. Uh, here, right here. There's the plural site course. I wonder if I can do this. Copy. I'm probably. I probably don't have the permission. Ooh, your bot didn't block me. Nice. I'm gonna spam the heck out of your chat. All right. Um, I think that's pretty good. Any Anybody have any specific questions about uh, specification? Um, on this repo, there's also a sample. Um, where is it? There it is. Sample, uh, so you can kind of see how it's used in here too. So you can go in and see, you know, here's, here's a bunch of different ways to do customers, specifications, or, or what have you, um, and see how those are used. So uh, there's a few different places with, with examples of specification. The eShop on web is one. Specification repository itself is one. And I, I think, did I get them in there? I'm, I'm adding them to uh, github.com, microdallas, white clean architecture. I'm adding them here. I don't remember if I got around to doing it yet, though, or if it's still in a branch somewhere. Um, yeah, they're here, too. Okay, so if you grab the clean architecture template, they're in here, too. Um, and so you'll get you'll get access to that there. And I think I even added to the readme and said all the different things this uses. Did I do that? Patterns. Yeah, here we go. Related projects. So here's my related projects that this thing uses. Um, so yeah. Tony asks, which pattern would you use if you need to call one of multiple different providers, external HP APIs, which only uh, which is only known concretely at runtime and per request, factory or strategy? All right, so let me think about if I understand this. A concrete example of this would be, uh, I need to call one of multiple different providers for external HP APIs only known concretely at runtime per request. So let's say the user wants to either post to Facebook or tweet, and they haven't decided which at compile time. Um, and so at runtime for this request, as part of that request to your API, they say, send this to Twitter or Facebook. Um, and so you are, are faced with, I've got a message and I've got whatever information I need to, to about the user. Um, and I need to either route it to Facebook or Twitter. And so I have an interface and that interface says, I have an iSocial media, uh, whatever, iSocial media service. Um, and at runtime, I need to be able to hot swap between these two. Um, so here's the cool thing that most people don't know about dependency injection in, in .NET and other things. You don't just have to ask for one thing, right? You don't just have to ask for one iSocial Media service provider um, or service. You can actually ask for an iEnumerable of iSocial Media service. And if you have registered more than one social media service in your container, it'll give them all to you. Um, and so you know, there's, there's a bunch of different ways you could slice this. You could use a factory, certainly. Um, and, and this is an example of using strategy because we're going to inject it. Uh, but, but out of the box, your, your DI container, whether it's the .NET Core one or, or some commercial one um, or, or open source you know, third party one, um, probably already does this behavior of giving you all of the instances that match that interface if you ask for uh, an enumerable of them. Um, and so you could, in your in your service, you could say, give me an I enumerable of all the social media service providers I have, um, and you'll get them, right? And in your constructor, you can assign them all to, to fields or whatever. Uh, and then inside of there, you can look at that request, and you know maybe the query string says, you know, service equals Twitter or service equals Facebook. Um, and you can have a, a switch statement or something in there that says, you know, match it up and say, if it's this one, use that. If it's the other one, use that one. Um, and pick which one to actually post to. 
Um, so that would be a pretty easy way to do it um, without having to implement your own custom factory logic. You could just put the switch statement in in the controller or in the whatever the thing is that's doing that work um, and, and, and pick accordingly. Uh, Martin asks, your two specifications that you showed from eShop and Web both required all filter fields added to it. Would it be better to chain the specification instead if we end up with complex filtering? Um, is Viseni still here? Okay, so I don't see him. Uh, he has a nice way to approach that that's uh, in here. So if you look at this sample, um, this is this is kind of building on to the specification pattern. Um, let me let me answer your first question, which should I be able to combine specifications with ands and ors and, and things like that? And the answer is you certainly can, right? You can have an and specification or an aggregate specification, and maybe in its constructor it takes in two other specifications and then it ands them together inside or whatever. I don't recommend that because um, you, you almost always end up building a bunch of complexity inside your calling code that has to figure out, okay, how do I do this, this conditional logic again? Which, which specification joins them the way I expect? And then I got to instantiate these other little low-level ones and pass them into this bigger one. And you can chain all that up, you know, and arbitrarily large. Um, and it just creates a lot of work for the person trying to consume your specification. Um, unless you've got this, this huge amount of, of complexity that's going to uh, multiply out because there's so many different fields or whatever that you might need, um, you're probably better served usually by just creating another specification that has just the things you need. Um, and maybe the, the requirements that it passes in are nullable, right? Maybe they're optional. Um, so you don't necessarily have to give it all the things um, in order for it to do its job. Um, I, would, I would lean toward that before I would start having ands and ors um, to compose multiple specifications. But another approach you could use um, is one that uh, Fiseni has, which is these filters. Uh, and this is Fiseni. Yep, he's still here. He's, he's talking. So if I say anything wrong, Fiseni, feel free to correct me in the chat. Um, so you can have a filter here, um, and you can specify what the, the different properties are uh, that, you, that you're going to filter on. Um, and, and then you could have you know whatever custom filters that you need for something. So your your customer search page maybe lets you filter down by name and email and address. So you put all those on a, a child of base filter. Um, and then you just need a specification that works with a filter. Um, and I think that's this one. So in this one now, it's going to say, just pass in the customer filter. It's, it's like a parameter object. It has all the different parameters that you might want to filter on. Um, and then you use that filter to drive all your calls into building the query uh, in the specification. Now, this means that if you change your mind and later on you want to add yet another thing that you want to filter on, you'll still have to change customer filter and you, you'll probably have to tweak this page, but you won't have to have a number of different customer specs for each one of these, right? You won't have to have customer by name specification, customer by email specification, customer by name and email specification, right? You, you avoid all that um, by having this, this one parameter object that's like uh, a bag of things you might uh, filter by. Does that help, Martin? And, and if uh, if you have any you know specific questions about it, you know Facini's on the chat here, so he can answer for you too. Chandra asks, do we need to do anything specific in patterns for handling the right connection pooling size? Um, the short answer is no. That that's an implementation detail that's specific to what your data access is. So the patterns don't care. The patterns are abstractions. Um, the implementation that you're using, let's say you're using Entity Framework Core, and let's say you care about how big your connection pool is, then somewhere in the configuration for Entity Framework Core, you can specify whether or not you're using connection pooling and how big the pool is and, and all those details. Um, but the patterns don't care, right? The patterns are much higher level than that. Um, and it, it, they're not, they don't get in the way of each other. Like you can use the patterns and you can control your pooling size, but they're not really related either. Cool. All right, any more questions for Steve? Uh, looks like we've got a, a bunch of thank yous and we had some, some previous thank yous uh, as well. So I think some others had to drop off uh, we've been going for a little over two hours strong, so uh, really appreciate you, uh, Steve, taking the time to to present to the stpete.net meetup. Um, we'll we'll hang out and see if there are any additional questions coming in. We shared a, a grand collection of links throughout the talk. Uh, this video will be backed up to YouTube as well, so you can find it on the stpete.net meetup YouTube channel. 
if you uh, let me turn on my light since you flipped the channel on me. You're welcome. Yep. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, this will be backed up to YouTube and we've got all the things and the socials. We've got our GitHub account. We've got the Twitter account. We've got the Facebook group. Uh, we've got the meetup page. You can follow us along there as well. Uh, if you want to volunteer to speak or want to volunteer one of your coworkers, uh, we're always looking for speakers. We're always looking for topics, suggestions. Uh, we will continue to do this virtually once a month, the second Tuesday of the month, until it is safe to resume in person in uh, in, or, in or around Saint, uh, downtown St. Petersburg, Florida. If anyone is going to be in the area when traveling is, is allowed and safe to do so, then we'd certainly love to have you. And yep. um, even after we do start doing in person again, it will still be streamed to Twitch for anybody who's out of the area. So that yeah. part's not going away. We will just be adding back the the in-person. Yeah, Clayton handles all the streaming duties for us, so be sure to, to give thanks to Clayton for getting all this set up and configured and being the man behind uh, the, the camera, so to speak. Let me, let me throw out there, too, that I'm on Twitch on usually on Fridays, um, twitch.tv slash Ardallis. Um, if you follow it, you'll get notified when I go live. Uh, and also, those are archived on YouTube as well. So if you go to youtube.com, whack Ardallis, you'll, you'll find all the previous streams that I've done. Most of the time, I'm talking about open source stuff. So things like uh, clean architecture and specification and eShop on web, those are generally the types of stuff I'm working on on my stream. So if you found this helpful, you know, feel free to drop in and... and listen and, and participate yeah I, I i tune in most fridays and and i've seen Ficini there as well and and seen you guys working on the specification pattern that's how i came came across it was i, I saw you guys working on it on stream and quickly adapted it for use in one of the personal projects that we work on uh clayton and i and our third host for the six-figure developer podcast uh, we, we stream the podcast on Mondays, but we also do live coding streams on Wednesdays. And we'll, we will be on the Six Figure Dev channel this Wednesday with special guest uh, helping us Kubernetesifying the Speaker Meet project. So if you want to follow us there and, and check out uh, a lot of these code samples that, that Steve has, a uh, very similar clean architecture pattern or, or, or solution organization uh, utilizing the uh, the specification pattern in there, uh, as well as React front end and Dockering all the things and Kubernetes defining all the things. We will be on the Six Figure Channel, Six Figure Dev Channel tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, with that, we will be back next month, next month, next year, the second Tuesday Jeez. of the month in January. Uh, if there are no additional questions for Steve, we will say goodnight to him and, and thank you. And thank you, chat, for everyone chiming in. Great questions, great uh, participation. Be sure to follow us on Twitch and Twitter and YouTube and Facebook and all the things. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thank you. Have a good night.